I believe that everybody has a story, and I'm fascinated to hear them. So come with me as we take a walk down Fascination Street. Hey guys, Fleet Foxes is coming to San Antonio May 8th, 2018 at 7.30 p.m. at the Tobin Center downtown. My listeners will get a 5% discount if they go to my website at fascinationstreetpod.com, click on the support the show page, and then click on the picture of Fleet Foxes. So enjoy Fleet Foxes, and thanks for supporting me. This episode is sponsored by Dollar Shave Club. I've been using Dollar Shave Club for over five years, and I love them. You get quality razor blades delivered every month to your mailbox with no hassle. No more drawers full of mismatched cartridges and handles. These great razors are delivered right to your mailbox for just a couple of dollars a month. Besides great razor blades, Dollar Shave Club also has shampoo, body wash, toothpaste, and Dr. Carver's shave butter. Go to fascinationstreetpod.com and click on the support the show page and then click on the Dollar Shave Club photo link to get started and receive a sweet introductory deal. Hey guys, you know I'm in love with the Menlo Club the monthly service that sends you really cool clothes? Well, a couple of months ago, I was hanging out with the CEO. We were having coffee in LA, and he was talking about the April package. Specifically, he was super excited about the April package because it's these dope-ass white shoes, these sneaks. And so I was talking with the guys at Menlo Club, and what they're going to do is, for my listeners, if you sign up as a member for April, not only will you get these amazing white sneakers, but if you use promo code FSP, as in Fascination Street Podcast, you will also get a really cool jacket and some awesome sunglasses thrown in with your April package. So sign up in April, you'll get the really cool shoes, a jacket, and sunglasses, all just for putting in promo code FSP when you sign up. I'm super excited about these shoes. I've seen them, and they're great for everything. You're going to want more than just one pair, and I don't even know if that's going to be possible. So sign up for the Menlo Club at themenlohouse.com and use promo code FSP at checkout. Hey, guys. While I was in L.A. a couple of weeks ago, I also got to sit down with Josh Denny. You might know Josh Denny because he's a comedian. You might know Josh because he's the host of the Food Network's television program, Ginormous Food. I caught up with Josh after a comedy show, and we talked about everything from his getting started in comedy, the events that led to him becoming the host of a show on Food Network, and his career in podcasting. This was a pretty fun interview. Josh is a really great guy. We talked a lot about charity and the homeless problem in L.A., and we talk about what in the heck happened to Chipotle. Didn't they used to be really good? All right, guys, enjoy. This is Josh Denny. I did one in my car last summer. It was like 110 degrees out and we couldn't run the air because it was too noisy. And it was at that point where I was like, I'm building a mini studio in my apartment and people can come to me if they want to do my podcast. Did you? Yeah. What'd you get? That's what I was telling you about earlier. I just got a couple of road mics. Did you put um, up soundproofing or any of that? No, no, not at all. No? No, that's not bad. I mean, the, the mics have like a built-in the cover. It's built into the mic, so then when you throw one on top of it, like a foam on top of it, uh-huh. it's so compressed, and there's so much. It's like having a double noise gate on it, so oh, okay. you get no real variation in the tone, and it's really good at, you know, you have to talk directly into them because you have no coverage whatsoever, but it right. uh, works pretty well. So are they directional? or No, they're um, cardioid. Oh, are they? Yeah. Sweet. Yeah, they work. They work really well. I, I mean, it was it was tough to, and they're dynamic mics, which is strange. Like you never get dynamic cardio in a USB. Right. And that's these why are, the these most. Are Rhodes? Yeah, they're the most expensive USB mics you can buy. Sweet. But they work really well, they're and better. it saves you the trouble of having to buy an audio interface, which I like because when you travel, it's one less thing to have to pack in the bag. Boy, is it! I bought a four-channel mixer. Yeah, well, a four-channel... Interface with a mixer? Yeah, yeah, interface with a mixer, and the fucking software on it... Was it a, a Zoom Tac 2? No. Nah. Ta- oh, okay. 
like this, you know, podcast starter kit or gotcha. whatever. You know, it was like a, a four channel interface and mixer and it came with two different softwares and two mics and stands and all that other shit. Yeah, the best thing, I think the best thing for podcasting, the best setup you could have is a Zoom Tac 8, which is the rack mountable audio interface with eight separate analog inputs. And then you could put all your mics directly into that, but you get independent digital interaction. So like the thing about that is most people that run their podcast through a mixer, they only get one master recording at the end. So they can't go in and move levels per right, person. Right. And you always get that person that's louder in the mix than they were through the mixer. Correct. It's always not me, by the way. Oh yeah. Yeah. It's, it's usually not me either. It's, it's uh, what always throws me is when I have somebody that either has an abnormally high voice or an abnormally low voice frequency right. wise. And then what happens is you get into the mix and you're like, fuck, I'm stuck with this. Unless I want to go in and like pull up every piece of waveform that they're speaking or down, which takes forever. Oh my God. I had to do that on one and it about fucking made me want to quit. It was yeah. Terrible. It's enough to make you stop. So it was fucking horrific. I did the exact same thing a couple times and then I was like, nope, I'm out. So I came up with a setup that allows me to change the interface or change the levels of each individual input in post so i can bring somebody's mic down and bring somebody's mic up that's really cool yeah it's good and that and that's what you that's why you want to go directly into interface and avoid having an analog mixer because i mean while the analog mixer might give you a better live and studio sound it's just not as good in post-production you can listen to it if you go listen to march of the pigs episode one where we're on handy recorders mm -hmm. and you listen to the last episode where we where we've got all the kinks worked out it only took us it took us like 90 episodes to get it <laughs> Sweet. To get it right, but Something you can hear a huge to. difference. Really? So let's talk about March of the Pig. Yeah. First of all, we're like Eskimo brothers. We both named our podcasts after our songs. Yes. Tell me about March of the Pigs. I started, I want to say, in 2014 or 2015. I think it was 15. But it started as really a suggestion from a fan or a friend of mine through social media. And uh, I say a fan, I think he started as a fan and then became a friend eventually. I, I, the reason I never did a podcast for so many years was because I was a regular guest on other friends' podcasts, which I really enjoyed. And I never really thought I had a unique approach to it that was, would be interesting in any way. It's funny that you didn't think that you had, you know, like your own voice, but... No, I didn't. But you have your own voice for comedy. That didn't stop you from being a comedian. Yeah, I guess that's true. I guess, th I think the difference is... On a local level, there weren't a thousand comedians when I started. You know right. what I mean? Like yeah. there were podcasts. Like everyone I knew that was a comedian had a podcast when I started my podcast. But, you know, you start to listen to them and it's kind of like comedy. You could show up and be like, man, there's already a million comics. But you start to hear, okay, well, not everybody's good at it. Right. Not everybody understands audio quality very well. Like there are some of the biggest, po I'm amazed, and not to say mine wasn't shitty at some point. But I was amazed that you can still listen. Bill Burr's podcast is one of the worst. It's like him in an echoey room with no soundproofing, shouting into a USB mic, That's and it's one of awesome. and it's one of the most. Well, it's very punk rock, yeah. but it's one of the most listened to podcasts out there. So That's there was crazy. some aspect of me holding back because a lot of the podcasts I would guest on were very well produced. And I thought, well, if I don't know how to do that or can't afford to build that, I shouldn't be podcast. Right. And then I started listening to some of the ones that were a little bit more punk rock to where it became evident that people really don't give a shit about audio quality. As long as it's not unlistenable, Right. Uh, they really care more about the content. As long as it's tolerable. I yeah. Think, I think they're a little forgiving. Yeah. It's gotta be, it can't be atrocious. Like you can't have the mic in that, that stand-up show we just did was way too hot until the end. Good God. It was so hot. I mean, it was, and it's feeding back and people are like, they're having trouble with the distance. And I don't know if you saw me cause I was standing kind of next to where you were sitting when Tony was on stage, but I kept going like this to him. Like, pull that mic down because it's way too hot for where you have it. I felt old because it was hurting my ears. Yeah, me too. I felt I that like, way. That's why shit. I kept walking out of the room. But, you know, it's that's that place's first show that they've ever done. Uh, they got a lot of kinks to work out. Let's just say. How are they going to make any money? I don't feel like that place is big enough to pay the rent. Well, one of the interesting things that they're doing is, uh, I don't know if you noticed, but they're for their open mics, they're charging their performers. Oh, I didn't know that. For stage time. Which is a mistake that a lot of new venues do. And then people go, I'm not going to fucking pay five bucks to drive all the way across Hollywood and perform for nobody. Right. So, you know, they'll, Especially if they'll figure that out. Especially if everybody's just standing out in the lobby. Right. 
And that's, you know, I talked, I was talking to you about that before we started recording. When you run an open mic, if you're not even making the comics watch the comics, like it's not going to last. And hopefully over time, if, if it's a mic where comics know that they have to watch other comics, then you're only going to get the people that really want to do comedy and the people that really like watching comedy. Right. Other than that, that's the thing. It was like this, the dude I was talking to who was bitching about that, he's like, oh, I hate when mics do that. And I go, why? And he's like, well, you know, I don't want to have to sit around and watch all the actors and everybody do comedy. And I go, they won't be there. If they have to stay for the whole four hours, right. they won't do it because they don't really want to be comedians. The guys who stay all four hours are the, guy who re- are the guys who really want to be comics. And, and it shows in their act over time. Those are the ones that I think get better the fastest. That makes sense. Yeah. So March of the Pigs, uh, it was a, a suggestion from a fan who later became a friend, a dude named Noah Dorsey. And he just said, most of the time when you're on people's podcasts, you're talking about food. So why not start a food podcast? And that's what we did. Who's we? Uh, me and no- Noah. So, oh, cool. So, so he, he was started, like, hey, why don't you do this? And yeah. Like, and then he actually, yeah. And he actually helped me start it. So he had gear in the first place and... You know, he would come over. We recorded the very first episode together, just kind of like talking about, talking through ideas of what it could be or what it should be. And then it took on a lot of different shapes and forms over the years. And then it's over now. What got you into comedy? You know, when I was younger, I was always into stand-up comedy. I feel like I was one of those kids who was just into it at a young age, like eight, nine, ten years old, because it was immediately something that kids weren't supposed to watch. Right. So that was what drew me to it right away. Of Anytime I was watching it, it always came with a caveat from whoever I was with, like an older brother or an aunt or, or even one of my parents who would be like, you know, you're not supposed to be watching this, but you can watch it. You know what I mean? So I was like, oh, why, why am I not supposed to be watching this? And then I would watch it and listen. And I'm like, oh, because it's kind of taboo, but it was fun. I didn't start in that world like theater comedy performing i was i played music i wanted to be in a, in a rock band and i was in heavy metal bands and stuff in my teenage years and in my early adulthood and then when my bands kind of fizzled out when i was 23 i thought like well why not go try stand-up like i've always loved it i've always wanted to do it it would be a way to go perform but i always thought i was definitely funnier than i was talented musically and so when I went and did stand-up, it just felt natural right out of the gate, and I, I fell in love with it right away, and that was like 11 years ago. What the fuck is that guy wearing? Oh, I don't know, this dude? Yeah, I feel like we're in that movie Warriors. Yeah, maybe. A little bit. There are characters on <clears throat> this city, man. You've been here for a few days. You probably know. You've probably seen it. I got in today at noon. Oh, okay. So well, I you, just got here. 12 hours. That's plenty of time to see all the crazies. <laughs> Like I told you, if I drove you two miles straight ahead of us, you'd see what looks like a fucking third world country. It's bad, man. It's, uh, you know, Skid Row is like two miles that way. It's pretty crazy. And it's it's rough. My girlfriend does a charitable outreach thing every Her year. Her name is Netta? Netta, yeah. And she she works yeah, with... Yeah, tell Just, me about that. I was going to ask you about the charity. She works with Justin Baldoni's charity, Carnival. Uh, they do a Carnival of Love every year on his birthday. His organization is called Wayfarer. They do a lot of different charitable stuff and, and volunteer work. And she's been doing the carnival with them on Skid Row for like four years now. You know, she loves it. And it's it's an interesting thing. Like, one of the things that infuriates me about the Women's March is that however many women it was this year, 700,000, a uh-huh. million, the, there's a million people that walked by Skid Row to do the Women's March. And if every one of them stopped to help somebody along the way, there would be no Skid Row. So it's it's so interesting to me how as people we can be so self-righteous in what we think is making the world a better place that we can literally walk by another person in need in pursuit of our own needs. And I think when you're able to do that, it completely voids any goodwill that you're trying to build, right? It would be like, it's like the old, you kill one person to harvest their organs and save five. And it's sort of like, it would be like going through that exercise and killing the person and then not getting the organs to people in time, if right. that makes sense. Wow, that's a, I haven't heard that take. That's a... That's interesting. Yeah. I, I mean, mean, it's true, but I haven't heard anybody say that. Well, and that's, and, and I don't know that that is everywhere that there was a women's march, but I think of other places I've been to. Well, I think this has probably the, the most homeless of any major city. Or in Portland has a lot as well. Really? Yeah, Portland was the first place I experienced homelessness to the degree where I, I was like, what the fuck, man? I was working for Hollywood Video and I was going out to their, their home offices were in Tigard, Oregon, which is just outside of Portland. It's like a suburb or something. Okay. And we went to downtown Portland our last night in town for these meetings. 
and it was like it was like the Third Street Promenade in Santa Monica, or mm-hmm. um, you know, you're from Texas. It would be like uh, I've been to Third Street Promenade. Yeah, West Side Comedy. Or Club. it's even like in Dallas, Addison. Oh yeah, okay. It's Addison, like Addison, yeah. where it's like you got where this main drag, is. all the restaurants. All the clubs, everything is on one street. Portland has a downtown area that's like that too. It's like the promenade or it's like, it's kind of like a on Broadway thing. And I remember us walking the streets to decide where to go for dinner. And it was literally like homeless person, homeless person, homeless person, like lined up. Do you know what it looked like? It looked like bodies from a concentration camp. Jesus. It was that many people. And I, and you were like stepping and I was just watching everyone going like just stepping over the bodies to get to like cheesecake factory and i remember going i'm visiting i'm here for six more hours and this bothers me how the fuck do you live here right. and walk over this every day and not be like can we do something about this right you know, not even from a, compa- a compassionate perspective even just from a can we like clean this up right even, even if you're not a compa- point, yeah right. even if you're not a compassionate person why is this okay and so that was like the first time, I think, and that was 2005, 2004. So that was the first time I'd ever seen homelessness to that degree where I was just like, this looks like a, this looks like a mass grave, like a huge burial ground of people just sleeping on the streets. And Skid Row's like that, except everybody has a tent, so it's a little bit better. Where'd they all get tents? I don't know. There's not a Bass Pro Shops within miles right. of this place. Right. I don't know where they're getting tents. Maybe they sell them at Ikea. Maybe. Uh-huh. Maybe people are, to, maybe the women's march, they're just bringing tents. <laughs> yeah, maybe, uh, that's, maybe they that all That fixes just the problem. Off. Yeah. Which, by the way, to me is like, that. that's a funny point you bring up, because that's like the whitest thing you could do, give to a, a homeless person, is like, here's a tent so that your shitty life is that much better, and I don't have to worry about you. Right. Like, I did my thing. I had a friend who used to be like, I go down there and I take blankets. I go, it's fucking 70 every day. <laughs> okay, take them a cheeseburger, man. What are you doing? Taking them blankets. <laughs> <laughs> and then he, he corrected me he said you know sometimes they fuck under these blankets and i go oh well, now i get it it makes sense it, now it is better than a cheeseburger right <laughs> Just kidding. like i can't fuck another homeless chick without a blanket so to throw over us while we're in front of the walt disney civic arts center nice <laughs> well, you were in portland is that when you were at croc no it was when i it was before that it was when i worked for hollywood video I left Hollywood Video in 2006 to go work for Crocs when they were a startup. How did you find out about Crocs? I had a boss that he had actually gone over there to consult. He was my boss at Hollywood Video, one of the guys that developed me in my career, helped bring me along. And he had worked in footwear before he worked in, he worked for FYE for your entertainment. He worked for them for a while, then came to Hollywood Video. So before that, his whole career was at Kinney Shoes, right? Which was like... Floorsheim, right. uh, Red Wing, I think, was one of their companies for a while. And then, obviously, Foot Locker was their biggest thing that eventually became its own company, I believe. Or maybe they absorbed Kinney. This is so many years ago now, I'm forgetting the trajectory of all of that. But because of his background in footwear, I don't even know how he came across the consulting gig, but they tapped him to consult. He went in, found that there would be a viable income stream if they dumped some revenue into retail and when they went public in 2006 they were focused entirely on wholesale he went in and and said hey not only do i think there's a lot of money to be made here on the retail side but i've got the team to do it and i was one of the guys he brought in to build their retail division have you met mario batali and does he owe you a thank you <laughs> no actually i haven't <laughs> i did a lot of people when we first started though thought i was like his little brother or something because of the resemblance and because at the time he was like the only celebrity that was affiliated with Crocs right. in 2006. Not a good guy to have affiliated with at this point because yeah, he just now. got, he got me too as well. So, yes. and maybe had the most epic response to it ever where he was just like, you think that's bad? Try these cinnamon rolls. <laughs> Did you see that? <laughs> no. No, he got a cute, his whole story came out. And he replied with, like, this open letter response and then put, like, a link to a recipe for cinnamon rolls at the bottom as if to say, like, none of this shit's really important to me. Everybody make sure you check out my new oh, cinnamon roll my God. recipe. And didn't he just open Italy in L.A.? Yes. Like, weeks before Yeah, how, how much does it suck to be one of the investors in that? Because as you find out, the food world is a lot like the entertainment world, as in... None of these guys are putting their own money right. on the line. Right. So, like, Batali is the face of it. He's probably got a little bit of skin in the game, but there's probably three other guys nobody knows about that, right. are, that are financially sunk into that place. Money fools. 
And I don't know if people, uh, you know, that's an interesting thing, right? Like we, we like to think that when somebody get outed for being a kind of a shitty human being that people just cease doing business with them altogether. But I don't know if that really happens. It, it, I think, it, I think there's a dip, but by no means do I think it lasts. No, definitely. Hey, look at Woody Allen's fucking career. Yeah. Jesus I, Christ. I mean, that's a great one, right? I don't think he missed a year. He makes a movie every year, and I don't think he missed a year during all that. Well, and the interesting thing is, I think if you look at the Woody Allen case, his might be one of the only ones where you could go, I could kind of see where maybe there's a conspiracy by his ex-wife. Like, I went back and watched all the interviews that he did with 2020 and 60 Minutes from, like, 93 when it first came out. And the thing that stuck with me, we just talked about this on March of the Pigs, the thing that made me scratch my head was when Mia Farrow like showed up to work on set like the day after she accused him of molesting their kid and like what parent in their right mind would discover that leak it to the press and then still show up the next day you know what I mean and so he had to fire her from the set and be like no you can't you're not going to work with me you're not going to continue to work with me after you accuse me of this to work on his movie on his movie Whoa. So when you see that part of the story, and he's like, yeah, I had to inform her that she no longer was in the part because she said I molested our kids. And so to think that she would go through that, and then also he had a pretty good trail of receipts of her saying that she was going to fuck him in the media, that she was going to accuse him of something and ruin his career. You know, everyone's first thing is like, well, forget about what Mia's relationship was with him. You got to listen to the victims. You got to listen to the kids. But I know what it's like being six or seven years old, an impressionable kid, just going through a divorce. I remember having to weigh whether or not I wanted to be on my mom's side or my dad's side. So who knows? what you could make a kid believe happened at that age. And I think the youngest kid that, that was part of it, is it Dylan Farrow, was like five or something or even younger at the time. So it's one of those things where if you grow up without both perspectives and you have one parent telling you this happened to you your whole life as a kid, then who's to say that you don't actually put yourself in that place and believe that it happened? Right. So I don't know. I think it's an interesting situation. Obviously, I don't know. And quite frankly, I don't give a shit. I've never I don't think Woody Allen's films are good as a piece of film. I've never been into his voice or his style. The neurotic Jew thing to me was never funny or interesting. You know, I just don't like his work because I don't like his work. It has nothing to do with what he may or may not have done. And, you know, years ago. Right. I don't know if I've ever even seen a Woody Allen movie. You, that's the thing. You probably have, and you don't remember it because they're not very good. Um, I know I haven't seen one in a while, and I don't know if I ever saw one before. But that is one where I look at it and I go, like, he's not nominated all the time. Like, his movies aren't critically incredible, like a Martin Scorsese. To me, it would make more sense if Martin Scorsese had done it, and then you go, but everything he makes is fucking fire, right? Right. It's Woody Allen. Like, most of his movies are like speed bumps in the press and in cinema. And so it's really amazing that he's continued to be able to make movies, to get funding to make movies, even with all the shit in the media. Like, he hasn't he hasn't been assassinated from putting out mediocre work or from potentially being a really bad guy. So if there's anybody who seems to have a bulletproof vest in Hollywood, it's that dude. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. How'd you get hooked up with the Food Network? Luck. That's what I tell everybody is a lot of luck. I mean, the podcast led me to the production company. The production, Yeah, the production company had been set on a mission to find someone like me that could host that show because they developed it with the network. And I don't know how many other guys they were looking at when they found me, but we went and shot a thing here in L.A. and they liked it. And then we shot a sizzle and they liked that. And we shot a pilot and they liked that enough to order the series. When we premiered, we were the highest premiered new show on the network in a long time. And we did really, really well through season one. And we did a second season and a third season and now we're done. So Oh, it's over? It's yeah, done. it's done. It's it's done for now. And Food Network doesn't cancel shows, they just don't go on hiatus. Yeah, they just don't order new episodes. Yeah. And then they have the and they ability own to it, Yes. So. so they can bring it back whenever they could hire another host if they want. They have that option because it's one of their properties. Plus, they could move it to Food Channel or... Well, they air it on everything. I mean, they're they're still selling it. That's the thing that I think is hilarious is that, for all intents and purposes, they've told us that we no longer have value at the network or we're not in the direction they intend to go in the new year after the merger with Discovery. But they're still selling it to other markets overseas. So uh, Food Network Italy just started running episodes for the first time. 
And so now I have a bunch of Italian people like tweeting at me. So in, do you in get Italian. a taste when they sell it? Nope. nope. No, that would be great, but nope, I don't. Really? Yeah. Yeah, your first deal. Like uh, there's no. Oh, that's right. Your, your, first, your de- first deal. You, your first deal, you take a lot of dick. Yeah, I heard. Basically, have to sign before you audition. And you yes. Know, you know what it's, your pay it's is not quite. Be. Yeah, it's not quite like that. You sign what's called a futures contract. So when you do a pilot, whether it's picked up or not, you agree to f- terms. Right. But it's like five year terms. Like it's yes. a while, right? Yes. It's a five year deal. Now, fortunately, I have a great entertainment attorney. And so he put in some significant financial escalators from year to year that would, if they were going to bring the show back at a certain time, they would be much wiser to renegotiate than to pay these premiums, which was smart. And also probably why they decided not to continue with the show outside of the first 12 month cycle, Mm -hmm. because the money would have gone up substantially in year two. But what they want to do and what the initial contract they sent over was a flat deal for five years. Right. And if I would have signed that, I'd probably be making 30, 40 episodes a year for the next five years and locked in and not able to do anything else. Right. So it's sort of like pick your poison. I mean, some people go, well, it's smart not to have signed that deal and to be into free agency, but then you lose the job security. Right. Uh, it's like anything else, man. You, you could leave your job of 20 years, take a gamble on a new company. And you could prosper or it could go belly up in 12 months. You don't know. So when did you get an entertainment agent? I didn't have an agent until right before season one started airing. So once you basically... I already had locked locked in. in. Oh, you were already locked in. Yeah. And then I got... When they sent me a contract, I got an entertainment attorney. You know, that was just the situation of like, here's my deal. Will you negotiate my deal for me? And then they get a percentage. Gotcha. Yeah, pretty easy stuff. So I know that you couldn't possibly have imagined ginormous food as a show because it didn't really exist. Mm -hmm. But other than comedy, like, did you aspire to be on TV? Yeah. Did you aspire to be on the Food Network at all? Never. I never thought I would be a guy who would, like, host shows like that. I never thought if I was ever on TV that I would be playing myself. I always thought that more than likely my ambitions were to be like a Seth Rogen to write and and direct movies and shows and then potentially appear in them, but not necessarily appear in them. If you listen to Seth talk, he talks about that all the time. Like he acted as a young guy, but he always wanted to be a writer, producer, director and creator and never really thought he would be a star actor, you know, always probably assumed he might do small parts Similar to how Kevin Smith is, I think. Like, Kevin Smith's not a movie star, but he's be- he's put himself in enough of his movies to where he's a recognizable personality. Right. I always thought I would be like a Kevin Smith or a Seth Rogen. I never thought I would be a Josh Denny, no pun intended, and not to have ego in that. But I never thought the first thing I would be famous for being is myself, which did, never appealed to me, never, never was a thing that I, I ever imagined. I think you'd have to be pretty crazy to see that. Like, people are going to love me just for who I am. Like, you'd have to be fucking insane to think that that's all you have to be to have a TV show or, or for people to like you. Right. Wait till they get a load of me. Yeah, it is it is sort of like that famous line. I know you probably wouldn't say or couldn't say, but is there anything in the works right now? As far as, um... Yeah, I've got, I've got a handful of ideas. I mean, I've got more than a handful, but I've got a handful of ideas that I think make sense for where I'm at in my career right now and what I want to do next. And I've talked with a couple different production companies, including the one that did ginormous about those ideas. This is the time of year right now where all the production companies are just now kind of finding out what everybody wants to buy. And so that'll determine what direction we move in. Um, But you know, there's a lot of ways it could go. I I definitely want the next thing that I do to allow me to be a little bit more comedic um, than I felt like I was on ginormous food. There was, there's so much footage on the cutting room floor of riffing and jokes and funny things that we did that just food network would never put in their program. They're just like, look, just be Guy Fieri. Yeah, that's really, I mean, and it's funny that you say that, but down to the way they edit the shows by the minute, they want them all to look the same. So it is a very, they have a very rigid format and it's a cookie um, cutter. It is. They're yeah. Like, look, this works over here. So let's do that here. And again and again and again. Exactly. Exactly. And and they basically have three cutters. They have three shapes. They have star, circle, and, and shit nugget. And, <laughs> and sometimes you get to be the star and sometimes you're the shit nugget. But it really is. They have competition and all their competition shows are, if you look at them, like you could run them side by side and minute by minute, they literally are the same yeah. shots, the right. same format, the same story. Um, and then they have their competition shows, same exact thing across the board. And then they have their travelogue shows, all identical. And so I think that's some of the problem is that people get in and watch those shows 
And I think they're loyal to the ones who did it first. So Guy Show has been on the longest, and I think people watch Guy Show, and they would watch our show. And I think we did a pretty good job of pulling some of our some of our own fans from Guy, people that liked our show more. But ultimately, people are just like, oh, why would I watch this? I'll just watch Triple D. That's what I know. That's what it's familiar to me. And they're really the same, like, down to the minute of how they're edited. They're the exact same thing. Right. When you have a show or when you have a contract or an agreement or whatever with Food Network, because I've been watching Food Network for a long fucking time. Mm-hmm. And I feel like they kind of use you for what they intended, and then once they feel like that's run its course, then they sort of put you on all these other fucking shows. Like you were on Beat Bobby Flay. Yeah, yeah, and originally I was supposed to be on Food Network Star as well. Um, really? What season? Uh, this past season, the one that ran like last summer or this past fall or whatever. Who won? Jason. The southern guy. The gay southern yes. guy. Yeah. Well, I don't think he's Lord gay. Lord Honey. Oh, Lord he's, Honey, yeah. He's straight up gay. Is he? Because oh, uh, yeah. I think he has a wife, which he said that, and it shocked me. I would be wildly surprised if he had a wife. Yeah, I, I liked him a lot. I thought he was great. I actually thought David uh, should win, but I think part of the problem for David was that, you know, the identity politics of that stuff run into play, right? David was probably the best on this season. I thought he was the most natural on camera, the most likable, well, the most the, energetic. The bearded, good big black, dude? big black dude. Oh, okay, yeah, 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 yeah. biker chef. Uh, he's a good buddy of mine, and I thought he was the best. But it was sort of like, well, we just had Eddie Gordon win a couple seasons ago, and we don't know what the fuck to do with him. So the last thing we need is another buff black dude that we can't find a vehicle for. Yeah, whatever so, happened to Big Daddy? Yeah, I mean, he's he just like you said, he, his pilot didn't go. Now he's just judging on a bunch of different things and all that. And I'm not really interested in that. I'm not interested in just being on TV for the sake of being on TV. Those things are cool little paychecks and they keep you in in the mix. But again, like it's all the same at Food Network. There were so many funny moments between Sonny Anderson and myself. And if there's any show that's got the equity to push the envelope at all with the network to say we're powerful enough to do this, it's Beat Bobby Flay. It's on at 10 o'clock at night. So you would think, what if it gets a little risque, who gives a shit? Right. But they still just took out all of the fucking meat of the fun that we had on that show. And it just went right back into their format. So it was one of those things where, you know, unless there's a, a tremendous philosophical change of Food Network, um, I don't expect there to be a whole lot of uh, Josh Denny cameos on shows. Really? Just because I don't see a point. I don't think it does anything for the network, and I don't think it does anything for me. So how did the Beat Bobby Flay come about? Originally, I believe they did it with intention of using it to help promote our show. Um, oh. But then, because the Beat Bobby Flay aired in December, mm-hmm. it was filmed in May. So that was before the decision was made not to continue with Ginormous Food. Gotcha. So I think originally the plan was that that would launch, and we would have a season four premiere that would launch right Right after that. Right after that, that Friday. So that aired on a Thursday, and I think the plan was for us to premiere in January, right after that episode, on a Friday. And it didn't. Interesting. Yeah, at that time we had been moved to Travel Channel. They were still airing us on both networks. They didn't really know what they were doing with us at that time. And and then they just made the decision to move on, so... And like I said, that could have been for a million reasons. It could have been because my deal had run up at that time and they would have had to renegotiate and it it would have been a lot more expensive. Right. But one of the things I'm learning about television and television executives is a good way to keep your job for a long time is to constantly be coming up with new shit and never ordering it. You look busy and you look creative and you look smart, but you're not making any decisions that can get you fired. That could cost money. So as long as you keep sourcing new shit and not running any of it for any major money or long extended periods of time you're not putting yourself at risk you look frugal you look scrutinizing because you never green light any of your own projects but to me or to the layperson, if i had a guy working for me that kept bringing me ideas and none of them worked after a year right even if they were the ones saying yeah that didn't work i'd be like well if you can't come up with something that works why do i have you right right but that's not how it worked so it's interesting um, what is Provoked? Provoked is uh, the name of my first one-hour special. And that was something that we were trying to do. Uh, it got disrupted from all this Food Network stuff because we crowdsourced it, or semi-crowdsourced it, in 2014. And then right around then was when the Food Network stuff started happening. And so the idea was like, well, we'll just kind of wait and see what we can develop from a stand-up perspective 
from a marketability and sales perspective. So like I would have never had the clout to walk into a major stand-up comedy production company and say like I want to do a special, here's the money I want, here's the budget I want, etc. because I really had no marketplace or no credit up until that point. So with the building of the Food Network show, we kind of said, let's see where this thing goes before we go do a stand-up special because we might be able to do it a lot bigger than we originally had intended. Originally, we were going to do it in a small theater, 100 people, simple stand-up. But as opportunity came up and, and as you know, Ginormous Food became a bigger and bigger thing and I got better representation and I, got, I made some other con- uh, contacts and connections, the ambitions for it grew tremendously. And now it's, it's something that we want to do, but we want to do it on a much grander scale than we originally had planned to. And, and I want to do a stand-up special that changes what stand-up specials are. I think there's too many one-hour tapes on Netflix of guys talking into a microphone. I think they put one out every week, don't they? Or the, every week, at I least one. every week. And now they, do them, uh, they put them one out like every week in almost every country. So there's a lot of foreign language stand-up specials and everything else, and... I'm very critical of what stand-up is and has become, and I want to put that into the special. And I critical from the perspective of, I think people take it way too fucking seriously. I think people take themselves way too seriously, and there aren't enough comedians that just have fun being comedians anymore. Like you watched that show tonight. Mm-hmm. I wasn't. I didn't give a fuck if any of it worked. Right. I was just. I was just trying to have fun. I was trying to get in a space. I'm rusty. I haven't been on stage in a couple weeks. I was just trying to get in the groove and just trying to work some new stuff in. And that's it. To me, that's when I have the most fun doing comedy. I want to do a special that brings the viewer to that place where they go, oh my God, like you don't have to limit all of your ideas to one type of comedy. It can be these different things kind of woven into the same show. Some of that, it almost felt like, well, some of it felt like crowd work. Yeah. Like the beginning. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that was just really kind of like feeling out the room and, and settling everybody in and, you know, trying to kind of corral the energy a little bit. Are you nervous? Like, you did a bit that might have made some other people a little bit nervous in front of certain sections of that crowd? <laughs> the black sections? Yes. Yes, definitely. Um, I, I'm not. And I learned pretty early on. So when I started doing comedy, I did a lot of black stand-up shows just because that was, that was the kind of comedy I grew up with, the kind of comedy I grew up liking. And that, when I started doing stand-up, I just gravitated towards that style. So much so that you could probably find old footage of me doing comedy wearing like a Sean John track suit with the pant leg pulled up, <laughs> the gold chain. Like I was going to be the white guy that did black comedy. Really? Uh, when I started, that was kind of the game plan. And I, and I love those rooms because they were way more raw. They didn't give a shit what you talked about. You just had to be funny. You know, I felt like the all-white comedy rooms were very judgy, almost like they would hold up scorecards after your jokes to tell you whether or not they approved of your material. And so I gravitated towards that, but I think because of that and because of some parts of my childhood, I'm way more comfortable in racially diverse rooms like that than I am anywhere else. I'd actually, if you told me I had to put in order of the way the audience would be for the special, for instance, I'd want it exactly 50% people of color and 50% white people. If I had to pick, I'd take all people of color because I think they would just have more fun than a room full of all white people because most of the time, no matter what you're joking about, for some reason, white people feel like they have to get permission to laugh at things. Yeah, it's really whitey that gets offended for everybody else. Yes, well, which is in a way more racist, right? It's sort of saying like, well, you guys can't stand up for yourselves. I'll do it. It's like everybody can take care of themselves, man. They don't need you to fucking hold their hand through the material. How much longer are you going to... Do you stand up like until you're dead forever? I think so. I think it'll always be a part of what I do. But I, I will say this. I am one of those guys that I don't believe in doing it just to do it. I believe like so a lot of times you'll talk to comics and you go, how often do you do open mics? How often do you do shows? And, you know, they do them every night all the time. And for me, it's really about like I, I have to be moved to want to get on stage and work on something. So there has to be something material wise that excites me about going and doing comedy and finding new ways to do it and different ways to do it. And so I think I'll always do it, but I don't think I'll do it at the frequency of a guy like Louie before all the shit went down, uh, where I'm putting out a special every year. A I'd brand ra- new one. Yeah. I'd, ra- I'd rather put out a really, really good one every three to five years. Um, as long as there's something new and interesting for me to talk about. 
It's funny that you brought up Louie. I, I think was... Rock is very good about that, by the way. I think Chris Rock, he'll, he'll put one out every five, seven years now, but they're really fucking great. Yeah. And they sort of span all of that time as well. They, they collect all of the broad strokes of what we've experienced as a group of people over five to seven years, and he just puts a perfect pin on it. Which is kind of how the Founding Fathers, if you will, used to do it. I mean, Cosby and Carlin and Pryor, they weren't putting them out every year. Yeah, Carlin wasn't putting them out every every year, even in the end. He was doing them every two or three years, but Carlin put so much perfection into his material that he absolutely would not just go up after a year and go, this is good enough. I got to see him about eight months before he died, right before he had recorded that last special, and he was at the Orleans Casino in, in Vegas, and he just was like glasses on he had a long table he had all of his material like a manuscript like a script okay. just stacked on the thing and he would literally at different points uh, obviously because he was memorizing it at different points he would need it at other points he wouldn't but there were times where he would literally just pick up the sheet and read through it and you kind of felt like oh my god what is this? like a we paid 60 bucks for these tickets we're watching this guy write right um, but you know it, it became more, it's shitty to say, but I appreciated it more because he passed away that summer and I thought, well, I got to see him rehearse the last thing he ever made. So, it was, and it was cool to see his process. He was a guy who was absolutely uh, driven to be perfect in the way he delivered his material. Yeah, he, he paid attention to nuances and, and specific Detail, words. Vocabulary, he would workshop the vocabulary. He was very precise. If there was, a, if, I, if you ever said who is the most surgical comedian ever to exist, that's a good word. Carlin is the most surgical. And and by the way, he could run that hour, fucking forty times before he recorded it, and I bet they'd be identical from memory, just because he was so good. At uh, at he would hammer it so many times. He would do two or three shows a night until he had this stuff perfect, and then he would record the special. That's dope, and you got to see it. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Yeah, I was like cripplingly sick with the flu in Vegas. I, I had the wild idea to take a girl I was friends with at the time to Vegas for Thanksgiving. It was like our anti-Thanksgiving Thanksgiving. And then I got super sick like after the first day we were there. I was in the hotel bed the entire time, but we had bought these Carlin tickets. And I was like, I am not fucking missing that. And so I just like, it was the kind of sick with the flu where you're just sweating from head to toe but all the time. But also have the chills. And you have the chill and you're cold and you, you're not, you're, hot, you're starving, but you feel like you're gonna throw up. It's like this constant conflict of feelings. And I just toughed it out and went there. And that's part of probably why I didn't enjoy it in the moment as much as I wish I did. But it was good to actually get to see him live before he passed away. That's really cool. What's your most memorable Food Network experience. And you can't say beat Bobby Flynn. No, that was fun, though. That was a lot of fun. You know, Sunny, she used to live in San Antonio. Oh, yeah? She used to be She's a, great. a DJ on the radio in San Antonio. We, um, we had such a blast, and she came up to me afterwards, and she said, you know, this is the last time we'll ever be together on a show like this. I said, what do you mean? She goes, we're both too energetic and funny. Aww. She goes, they'll put, they'll put you with somebody who sucks next time, and they'll put me with somebody who sucks. And I was like, well, that sucks. <laughs> I was like, why don't they just not have the person who's boring and sucks? And then she's like, yeah, tell me about it. But oh. it's so funny. It's like they have this idea that, you know, we'll have one chef no matter how boring he is. And then we'll have Sonny because she livens it up. And it's like, right. how about you just have two Sonnies? It makes it funny. Right. There was so, we were riffing with Bobby so much. And there were so many... Was, was there he was, playful? Yeah, he's, he's a great guy. He's super... I thought he was going to be super serious and tight Oh, you're just saying ass. that because he's a ginger. No, 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 not at all. And he's hardly ginger anymore. He's graying up pretty pretty quickly. Uh -huh. No, the nicest and most welcoming guy and um, had some really nice things to say to me, being the new kid on the block. We had so much fun. Like, she was giving Bobby a hard time about the fact that he only dates, like, weird white chicks... And um, she's like, this is why you end up on TMZ all the time with Damn. this bullshit. Because you're dating these crazy white bitches. She's like, you need to get you a black woman. And then I said, in front of the live audience, I was like, great, you're going to get him off TMZ. He's going to end up on World Star Hip Hop. And the audience just fucking erupted with laughter. Which isn't racist or offensive in any way. It's just commentary just on saying he's going to have the same problems. They're just going to be on a different network. And the audience laughed hysterically at that. And that probably was the first fucking thing cut because... 
you know, they, yeah, they're just, they're, oh, it references that black people have different tabloids than white people. We don't want to be divisive. But sometimes I think television executives, in an effort to be divisive, aren't inclusive. Like, I'm acknowledging that there's a black equivalent to what she's talking about and doing it in a funny way. And that is so scary to them that they'd rather not air it. Do right. you know what I mean? Like, who would hear that and go, oh, my God, that's so offensive? Uh, Whitey. White people, yeah, right. They would just go, that's offensive. It's like, because they know that they watch World Star Hip Hop for all the wrong reasons. <laughs> <laughs> that's why they don't want to air it. I watch World Star for the fights and, and the inappropriate racial shit. So we can't reference that. Yeah, it's white guilt, man. White guilt ruins every fun piece of art that's ever existed. It does. So you said that you took your friend to uh, Vegas for Thanksgiving, sort of an anti-Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. uh, you kind of have a tradition of not celebrating Thanksgiving in a, in a traditional way, don't you? I guess so. I think uh, a lot of times we have, I've only, I've only really done traditional Thanksgiving now for the last couple of years because I've had the same girlfriend and my mom will come out for Thanksgiving now. But, but yeah, they're actually of all the holidays. I probably had the weirdest things I've done beyond Thanksgiving. A couple of years ago, you, didn't you just spend Thanksgiving like at a homeless shelter, like handing out food or something? Well, that was this year. We, was but, that year? but that was the day before Thanksgiving. Okay. So Wednesday night we went and did like a taco night for, uh, you know, people that were in a live-in facility in Santa Monica with a company called The People Concern. And it was one of those things of, like, I felt like I wanted that experience. Like, I had never done it before. I'd never done any volunteer stuff before. And I think in a lot of ways I wanted to see if I would feel anything by participating in it and being a part of it. It's an interesting thing to explain to people because people go like, oh, did you feel really bad for them? Or did you feel like, did you feel this way or did you feel that way? And I didn't have an emotional reaction to it at all. I just felt needed. As soon as I got there, I was like, holy shit, nobody here has a plan. Nobody here knows what we're doing. Nobody here is prepared to deal with this if this comes up. So it was almost like I put my old business management hat on. It was like, all of this just needs organization and people working. And so when people always ask me like, well, when you do charitable things like that, how does it make you feel? I, I don't ever feel like the work is done to where I can even react to that. But I also think that there's a lot that comes out of just showing up sometimes and being of service and just being willing to put in a hard day's work and get nothing out of it in return and do something that's completely fruitless in terms of what you tangibly get back from it, right? A lot of people will go work that hard every day and that's their life. You know what I mean? They're in a kitchen every day and they make 10 bucks an hour or whatever and they're sweating their ass off for their own survival. It's nice to go um, and do something that's just good, honest, hard, simple work and do it for someone else and get nothing out of it. I feel like it's a necessary reminder to maintain good discipline in your life, if that makes sense. This seems like sort of a through line for this whole kind of interview. I mean, you were started off, you were talking about you know, Skid Row and everybody just stepping over them and what the fuck. Where did you grow up that this was ingrained into you? Because nobody else seems to give a shit. Well, it's not, and I wouldn't even say I'm the poster child for giving no, a shit. No, you just seem like you care but a little bit I, more I'm than a, everybody else. But I care about real action. Like, I, you know, it drives me nuts. You heard me do a joke tonight where I talk about I hate, I hate the facetiousness of giving online of people that are like, uh, oh, you're dying of cancer? Here's 50 bucks. I did my part. Now go away. That's bullshit. Pick up the phone and call the dude and find out what he's going through in his life and how you specifically might be able to help him. And if there's not a way and money really is the best thing, then do that. But I feel like so many people retweet a fucking post or they get behind a cause or they share something on Facebook and that's the extent of what they do. They don't roll up the sleeves. They don't get involved. They don't actually do shit. And so... For me, I care more about the work of it and people actually rolling up the sleeves and doing something about it than this fake facade of, uh, we care. We care about people. Well, you're stepping on people to talk about yourself. I mean, so to me, I think it's more my brain as a comedian immediately shoots right in for the hypocrisy of something. And to me, if I ever participate in those things, I just want them to be honest and clean and to say, I didn't know what I would get out of it, if anything. I just know that they needed my help, that I had the time and wanted to do it. And by the way, I felt extremely useful and purposeful while I was there. 
And that feels good. It feels good to go somewhere and feel like, wow, they needed me today. Because if I didn't show up, this would have been a lot harder. Or it wouldn't have been as good. Or it wouldn't have been what these people needed. And that might sound egotistical or whatever. But, but I can tell you, I haven't sweat that fucking hard as I did in that kitchen that night making tacos. And it was only a service of like 55 people. And when the, the fat comedian that hosts the Food Network show is the most culinary astute guy in the kitchen we got a problem (laughs) and so i'm in there doing all the prep and like firing stuff off and and like basically it being an executive chef and i don't even have one day of culinary school under my belt it was just all the experiences of working with these chefs on ginormous food over a year actually paid off and it felt like oh my god maybe all those time all that time i spent with them and what i learned even though i'm not going to be a chef or or run my own restaurants or something. Maybe it was for that. Maybe it was so that if I decide to go do those things, I'm a little bit more astute, a little bit more capable, and can be of better service. So I don't know if that answered your question, but it matters to me. I feel like if you're not going to do it right and you're not going to make a difference, don't get off the fucking couch. Right. Well, the question was really, where did you get that from? I don't know. I don't I don't know where I got that from. I, I think I come from a family that prides themselves on keeping it real you know, as corny as that sounds, I came from a family that never let anybody believe they were bigger than they were. And, and, you know, that's like a Philadelphia thing. Everybody's always checking each other's egos and checking each other, like bringing people back to reality. You could win a lottery and be like, oh, what, you think your shit don't stink? You know what I mean? So it's very much part of the commiseration of being from that part of the country. I think you go through life being constantly aware of, am I taking too much for granted? Or do I think too highly of myself? Or am I out of touch with reality? And I think I constantly ask myself those questions. And I think if I ever do feel that way, I try to put myself in positions or even preemptively put myself in a position to remind me that you're not that fucking far away from this being your life. I think still driving rideshare is a reminder of that, of like some people show up and wake up every day and they drive Uber or Lyft or whatever, and that's their job, and they don't have comedy or television that eventually will pull them out of it. They have no plans for what happens beyond that, and that's a tough thing to wake up and and feel every day. But I think there's a lot to be said for continuing to find ways to put in a, a hard days of honest work as you continue to climb in an industry like entertainment, where sometimes the revenue isn't necessarily relative to the amount of work that you put in. You know, a guy like Chappelle, making a hundred million dollars for roughly 10 hours of work, pretty good payout a little bit. for that amount of time, right? It would be easy, I think, for a lot of people, if they're not disciplined, to lose perspective on how hard other people have to work to get remotely close to that level of comfort. And so I feel like every time in my life I've had an opportunity to step up into a better level of comfort, I have to remind myself, it wasn't that long ago that shit was way harder for me. And it, and it might not be that far away that it happens again. I think that's an important aspect of staying grounded. Do you have any plans ever to open any sort of restaurant? Yeah, after I just said I would never run my own restaurants. I would love to own a restaurant and to be a part of something. I think it just like has be to be the money the, guy? Like Not necessarily the money guy. I think I'm the more the vision guy. I want to be the money guy when it comes to cash and the checks for sure. I think more importantly, I just want it to run right. Whatever I get involved in, I would want it to be the best thing that's in that space. So if it was a fast casual, I'd want to reimagine what fast casual can look like in terms of execution, customer service. I don't know how long, you know, Chipotle has been around in your life, but I remember Chipotle back in 2006 when it was very new in Minnesota where I lived. And it was amazing. The service was amazing. The freshness was amazing. Everything about it was amazing. And now it's just another shitty fucking place. And it's like, how did you go from being the place that set the standard to being just another shitty fucking place? And that's the stuff that drives me nuts. Because it's like you had a great idea and you fucked it up. I think they got too big to manage the standard. Yes. But that starts at the top. Restaurants and businesses and everything fall to that level because somebody somewhere says, that's okay. And they just let it slip through the cracks. And then that that little tiny crack becomes a big fucking canyon. And eventually it's too big to fix. Look at all the companies. American Apparel, limited stores. These were iconic empires of retail. I love that you said limited. They're gone. Yeah, they are gone. Limited, at one time, 
Every fucking major executive that was recruited for any retail company started at the Limited, which was Victoria's Secret, Lane Bryant, right? They had a ton of brands under the Limited, and they even had the, the stores delimited for a while. And Limited 2. And Limited 2. T-O-O. And so that was like the gold standard of retail, and somehow they became one of the first to go out of business and shutter almost everything. And many years ago, they sold off Victoria's Secret which was probably the only viable brand that was left in their portfolio. Kind of like Craftsman and Sears. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, I mean, there's a lot of, boy, what a Texas thing to say. <laughs> like Craftsman and Sears. Well, I mean, Craftsman was the only thing that Sears had going for it. Okay, so we're going to wrap this up. Okay. I need you to explain your uh, crabs in a bucket, crabs in a pot. Mentality? Yeah. Tell, what? Me, tell me about that. Explain it. Because... I heard you express it very, very well on another podcast, mm -hmm. and I think I even tweeted you. I'm like, that's fucking genius. Well, I think most recently I tweeted something about, I was talking about the Lady Doritos. That's what it that's was. That's what it was, and I said, <laughs> the Lady Doritos, when one of them tries to get out of the bag, all the other ones pull it back in. It is a reference to the crab in a bucket mentality. I heard that first from a buddy of mine named Daryl Horner when I first started doing comedy, and he told me, he goes, beware of comedians because as you rise in your career you'll find out that even though you feel like you're one with the crabs and every and you guys are all the same and you're all trying to get out of the bucket together if you're the first one to grab that fucking ledge the chances of everyone else coming out with you are a lot less than everyone else grabbing you and pulling you back in and he goes if you watch crabs in a bucket they actually do that and he was from Alabama. I think he had learned that from his it was a old saying of his grandmothers or somebody that he had grown up with but it's funny because I, I grew up around crabs as well, being in Philly and, and Maryland growing up as a kid. We ate a lot of crabs, and I remember seeing that. I was like, so it was like a very real thing. But it is an interesting place, and I think or an interesting analogy for the way so many things unfold in our society today. I think everybody has this mentality of like, if that guy gets up, fuck him. I'll pull him down instead of trying to lift myself up. I think the Kim Kardashian thing that just happened on the internet is a great example of that. People aren't mad at Kim Kardashian because she didn't give the right credit for her hairstyle to the right group of people. If we cut through the bullshit, people are mad that Kim Kardashian influences black culture to the degree that she does in the first place. And all that anybody bitching about anything Kim Kardashian does is crabs in the bucket. It's other people going, that bitch shouldn't get to influence culture the way that she does. So I'm going to pull at her and I'm going to tweet at her and say that she's racist and she's appropriating and everything else. And I'm going to try to pull her back in the bucket. And I think there are so many instances where if we really cut through the shit, it's more crabs in the bucket than it is people really trying to seek justice. Does that make sense? It does. Well put. I like it. Lastly, tell everybody where they can find you and your podcast. Well, the new podcast will be called The Implications of Josh Denny. It's going to be, it's kind of a, kind of poking fun at the fact that I love to talk about shit I haven't researched. Sweet. <laughs> I love to just make a damning statement about something I have no information on and get the other person to explain it to me or to defend what I said if it involves them. So uh, it'll be a show kind of about everything. And um, that starts in March. There'll be a ton of stuff on my social media for people to, to be able to participate in the launch of that. And I really want to make it a podcast where people have the ability to influence what it is. So I created a closed group uh, for the podcast on Facebook. You can go to my Facebook fan page. It's the Josh Denny with the blue check mark. And you can join or ask to join that group. But you'll have the ability to influence what kind of guests we have on, what topics we talk about every week. And listen... I like to work smarter and not harder. To me, it's much easier to have people tell me what they want me to talk about every week than it is to guess. Sure. And I think that's a good way to keep people engaged. So. And it's called? It'll be called The Implications of Josh Denny. Okay. And we've got a real, I'll show you the cover art for it. I got this really great artist working on it for me. So I'm looking forward to getting that thing going. Cool. Uh, but otherwise, people can find me on Twitter, at Josh Denny. We still do the Darkest Hour podcast on Adam Todd Brown's on Pops Network. Um, we still do the Darkest Hour stand-up show every month in Santa Monica. People can check my... In Santa Monica at the West Side Comedy Theater? You got it. On uh, Third Street Promenade? You got it. And then people can check my calendar for any road dates. I, I've got some road dates coming up that'll be sprinkled in here or there, but no real long-term touring plans. It's pilot season, man. I'm trying to make a new TV show. Word. Still doing March at the Pigs? No, that'll be done.
Really? The yeah. last episode of March of the Pigs just went up. Yeah. Really? I feel like it served its purpose. It was a food show. Uh, but as I stated in the podcast, it's so tough to get five hours of somebody's day, you know, to, to get them to meet up with me somewhere, to eat lunch, then to go back to my place, record, record for maybe two hours. I mean, it ends up being a half of a day. And um, it's just too tricky to get all those people. How many episodes did you end up doing? I don't know. Total? I think we did somewhere co- maybe close to 100, maybe about 70. I'm not sure. It felt like it was time. Yeah. You know, listen, to me, if you can put a bullet in something before other people tell you to, it's probably a good idea. Nice. Uh, it was just, it was, I wasn't interested in doing it anymore. And um, that to me tells me it's time to move on to the next thing. So gotcha. I'd rather be able to just sit down and riff and talk with people about whatever than to be so drilled into the format of, this is a food show. We have to talk about food. It got to the point with some of the episodes recently, if you listen, we're like, we'd talk about food for two minutes and then we'd be on to whatever else. So right. it kind of felt like we were using that mechanism out of obligation and not because it was really working or it was a fun thing to do. Gotcha. Cool. Well, Josh, Denny, thank you so much, man. Yeah, man. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Yes, sir. Hey, guys. If you like what I'm doing... Click the Amazon banner at the top of the homepage on FascinationStreetPod.com and do all of your shopping through Amazon. Once you click on it and it takes you to Amazon, you can bookmark it or add it to your favorites and you won't have to go to my site each time. It helps me keep the show going and again, thanks for listening to Fascination Street. Opening music is the song Magnolia from the 2014 album Intransigence. Used with permission from Douglas Miles Clark. Closing music is Apollo from the 2001 album Into the Known by the band Sapphire. Thanks for hanging out with us and getting to know a little bit about our guest. We'll see you next time on Fascination Street.